Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures on practical electromagnetics for engineers. We continue our review today with a somewhat more complicated topic in algebra, which is complex numbers. Now, complex numbers are a necessary evil in algebra, and let me explain why I'm saying this. It turns out that mathematicians of long ago just sort of tore out the hair over a really simple algebra problem, which is this one right here. x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Because if you go ahead and you rearrange this, you get x squared is equal to minus 1. And we know we can't square a number and get a negative number, but this equation is so simple it needs a solution. It just has to have a solution. And so one day some bright boy realized, gee, if I make up a new number, I'm going to call it an imaginary number, where the square of this imaginary number is equal to negative 1. In other words, i squared is equal to negative 1, where i is this new imaginary number, then the solution to this equation becomes quite simple. It's right here, and all I need is this new type of number. Now, the choice of imaginary number was really unfortunate, because how can you have something that's imaginary? Um, but that's what we call it, so that's what we're stuck with, so, so deal with it. Now, any time you see an i in front of a number, it's an imaginary number. But mostly what we deal with are numbers that aren't purely real or purely imaginary. They're complex numbers, and they're given by this form right here, a real part plus an imaginary part. And it's really easy to tell these apart because the real part does not have an eye in front of it, and the imaginary part does. Um, and every complex number has a real and imaginary part, but A can be 0, in which case it's a purely imaginary number, or if B is 0, then it's purely a real number. And the nice thing about this one invention of an imaginary number where i squared, the, the root imaginary number, is equal to minus 1, means now we can solve pretty much any algebra equation. So, so this one little complication allows us to solve a huge number of problems that we couldn't before. So overall, it's a worthwhile trade-off. So you can ask again, what's an imaginary number? And the answer is a tool to solve algebra and other types of equations. And you say, no, come on, no numbers can't just be tools they have to be something they have to have some meaning but really what's an imaginary number it's a tool to solve equations just like any other tool if it's useful you don't have to question its roots because you find it useful to do it so as long as you accept that we can get on with life now it turns out that there are some simple and not so simple rules of algebra with complex numbers um, these look long, but they're really not that bad. If you add two complex numbers, say a plus ib and c plus id, those are two complex numbers, well, you just add the real parts and you add the imaginary parts and you keep them separate because it turns out one of the great things about complex numbers is real parts and imaginary parts don't mix. The real stays real and the imaginary stays imaginary when you're doing addition. Of course, when you're doing multiplication, you can mix these two parts in a way, but this is also easy because you just treat i as another variable in your equation. You treat it just like you would any other variable in algebra, and you multiply this thing out. You've got a real part, um, two imaginary parts, and one term that has this i squared, but we know i squared is equal to minus 1, and when we plug, plug that in, we again get another complex number. Not a problem. Just like doing algebra, no big deal. It turns out that if we multiply a complex number times the same complex number with the negative of its imaginary part, right here, for example, here we have plus IB and here we have minus IB, we get a purely real number. And this comes in really useful when we're doing division problems. Because if you have a complex number divided by another complex number, it's really hard to separate it into its real and imaginary parts. But there's a math trick for this, too. You just multiply it by the denominator where you've changed the sign of the imaginary part is shown right here in this equation and when you go through and multiply this out you come up with a number that you can separate into a real part and an imaginary part and of course the denominator is all real so that separates out very nicely and it turns out that when you're solving these types of problems you really should try to s write a complex number so it can be separated into a real part and an imaginary part that's almost always the right answer and you'll some professors will take off points if you don't do that separation. Well, this trick of turning the imaginary part negative is so useful, we give it a special name. And this is it right here. We call taking the imaginary part, taking a complex conjugate. And we represent complex conjugates by putting a little star above the imaginary number. So anytime you see an imaginary number with a star, the star means just take the negative 
of the imaginary part. And it turns out that when you multiply any complex number by its complex conjugate, you get a purely real number, which is why it's so useful. And we'll talk about this in a little while. Now, now these are the simple algebra tricks, things if you know your, your algebraic manipulations, you can just plug in i, and if you know that i squared is equal to minus 1, you can figure it out all on your own with a little bit of work. There are a couple more complex ones, such as raising a number to a complex power. Well, what we say with this is, you know, let's just have the number raised to its real part and the number raised to its imaginary part, and it turns out that a number raised to its imaginary part can in turn be written as a complex number. Now, now what does this mean, you say? Well, now we get into this sort of tricky part with equal signs in algebra and this sort of mathematical reasoning, which I'm not going to go into too much. But if you multiply w to the ib times its complex conjugate, you're going to end up with w to the 0, which is equal to 1. But if you put x plus iy into this, you're going to come out with x squared plus y squared. Now, this leads us to think of something. What two things, when we take the square of one plus the square of the other, is equal to one? And if you remember your trigonometry, we come up with this equation right here. And after you go through some mathematical manipulations that I'm not going to because they're not particularly transparent and not particularly germane to actually solving problems, you come up with an equation that looks like this one down here, and this one is really important. This is called Euler's equation. e to the i theta, remember e is Euler's number and it's 2.7 something, e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine of theta, and we're going to use this a lot later on as we start to work problems in electromagnetics. And then once you have this, you can basically go ahead and calculate um, how to take a number to a complex power. And this is the formula. Remember that this term, natural log, is log base e. We talked about logarithms in the last lecture, 0 0.3. And we don't need to drive this thing. It's a little bit tedious. But remember that this is the equation if you have to take a number to a complex power that you're going to use. And it's a pain in the butt if you do it by hand, but on a calculator or a program like MATLAB, no problem at all to work this out. So let's summarize what we've learned so far. Rules of algebra with complex numbers. In addition, adding two complex numbers, the real part and the imaginary part are two separate things. You add the real parts and you add the imaginary parts. They don't mix. In multiplication, you just treat i as a variable, remember that remembering that i squared is equal to minus 1, and you work the multiplication out with algebra the way you would with any polynomial equation. Don't leave complex numbers in the denominator because you can't separate into real parts and imaginary parts. Um, for power laws, you have this equation right here. Write it down somewhere and look it up if you need it. You're not going to use it very often. And Euler's equation is going to make your life much, much easier. So this really is one that you need to commit to memory. Okay? You need to remember this one and, and know what it is because you're going to use this one a lot. Also remember that imaginary numbers are mathematical convenience. We don't actually measure complex voltages or currents or complex anything. We only are going to measure the real part of this. So even though we use imaginary numbers to solve equations, and imaginary numbers come up in our answers, when we actually the measure, measure whatever it is our equation is telling us is going to be, the imaginary part is not there. It's just a mathematical convenience, but it's a really good one. So before we quit, let me go into another thing called argand diagrams and phasers. And phasers are something electrical engineers use a lot. And since this is an electrical engineering lecture, we're going to use a lot of these as we go on. One way that we can represent complex numbers is on what's called an argand diagram, where you have two orthogonal axes here, a real axis that goes this way, and the imaginary axis, which is the i that goes this way. So we can represent a complex number, a plus ib, as essentially sitting in this coordinate plane. And so it has a real part, a, going down here. Also, it's got an imaginary part, b. And we can simply write the complex number as the place in that coordinate frame that this number exists. This is a pretty common way of doing things. Well, it turns out another way you can represent complex numbers is not just by its xy coordinate, but by how far away, let's call that m, the magnitude it is away from the origin, and the angle theta that, let's try this again, the angle theta that essentially connects the x or real axis with the direction this magnitude vector goes. Now, 
you probably know all of this already, but remember when we represent a complex number, we can represent the value of a as the magnitude times the cosine of theta, b as the magnitude times the sine of theta. The size of m is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared right here. It's essentially how long that is. That's the triangle law for right triangles. And theta is given by the fact that the tangent of theta is equal to b over a. So we've got all kinds of different ways to represent this number. And of course, we can take the arc tangent to calculate the angle theta if we know b and a. So this is just relating one way to represent complex numbers, which is a real part and an imaginary part, with a different way, which is a magnitude, how far it is from the origin, and the angle, the line that connects the point in the plane to the real axis. Now, this is called phasor notation when you represent a complex number this way and you're like, gosh, that's a real pain in the butt. Now I've got to remember trigonometry besides complex numbers. Why should I learn this? Why are you bothering me with these facts? Well, it turns out that phasor notation is really useful. It's not useful necessarily for adding two complex numbers. If we have a complex number a plus ib, we can represent it in this way. And of course, through Euler's equation, we can simplify it and represent it as a magnitude times a phase term. There's the magnitude m. This e to the i theta is the phase. If we add this, basically we just add two phases and that doesn't help us. But look what happens when we multiply two complex numbers in the second line here. Instead of going through all this algebra, we can represent this multiple multiplication as simply the magnitudes and the sum of the phase terms. That's much easier to figure out, and it becomes even easier and less algebraic intense when we do division. If we have a division of two complex numbers, we represent it this way, and all we do have to do is subtract those phase terms. So in multiplication or division of complex numbers, sometimes it really helps to go through the extra step of representing them as phasers, because it makes the math much, much easier. And we'll see much more of this as we move along. And again, let me remind you that if you need some review of mathematics. There are more mathematics videos at this website right here, all divided by many different topics, all very short like this one.